Good afternoon and welcome to the Preservation Association of Lincoln Brown Bag Lecture Series. <coughs> My name is Eileen Burke and I'm the coordinator of these brown bags. Our lecture today is sponsored by Speedway Properties. If you're interested in these programs, please join our membership and you can go to preservelincoln.org. Our speaker today is Jim McKee. Jim is a lifelong Lincolnite. His great-grandparents pioneered in Lancaster County in the 1870s. Jim is a, has a bachelor's degree from UNL and operates J and L Lee Company, a publisher of regional books. Jim has written over a thousand articles and books on Lincoln and Nebraska history. He's on the Historical Society Board of Trustees and also serves on the City of Lincoln Historic Preservation Commission. He's also a founding member of the Preservation Association of Lincoln. This is a series of talks titled Jim McKee's Complete History of Lincoln and this is program number 25. These programs are videotaped and shown on Channel 5 and they're also streamed on YouTube so you can also see them there. Jim invites you to ask questions during the program. Please join me in welcoming Jim McKee. I see Clay is out there someplace, and I remember when we first started this series, we were talking about how many would there be in the series. Uh, I think we decided 10 and then said, well, probably more like 15, uh, and you've stuck with us, and now we're up to 25, and I like to say this is number 25 in a series of 15. And <laughs> frankly, I don't, uh, I, we don't see any end because new history is being written every day, I guess, partly. And you will figure it, well, you and your brother will figure a tiny bit into today's program, not much, but see if you can catch it. Uh, one of the notes I made last time was that I wanted to mention something that I forgot to when we were talking about Nebraska Book Company uh, and Ernie Long, who had started Nebraska Book. Uh, and we remembered the Nebraska Book Company when it ultimately moved over to 1135 R Street. And I may have mentioned that Mr. Long, but I don't think I did, Mr. Long, when he sold Nebraska Book to Johnny Johnson, uh, retained an apartment upstairs uh, and a lifelong interest in that apartment and the apartment was not small it was very large looked out over uh, the uh, sculpture garden uh, across the way at Sheldon and he stayed in that apartment uh, until ultimately he passed away uh, long long after he sold the business and so in the 1960s uh, Johnny took over the old apartment and turned it into his private office which was huge and also had a beautiful setting. Uh, not so much anymore, but it's now, of course, the site of the LEED Center. And I know I forgot to mention that. Uh, we were talking, we're, so far we're chronological. At one point, probably in another six or eight programs, we'll start doing catch up and pick, picking up things here and there and everywhere. We're still fairly chronological. Uh, we're taking now a look at the time of World War I in the city of Lincoln. This particular picture is part of a series that was taken by a gentleman in Lincoln, um, and I ended up with a collection of, uh, this is a picture I usually use on Valentine's Day programs, but it is the troops leaving uh, the city of Lincoln uh, in September of 1916 when the Nebraska National Guard was called up uh, to the Mexican border. And at that time in 1916, there were several reasons uh, given for this call up. The primary one was to stop the invasion of the United States by Pancho Villa. Uh, and everybody seemed to buy that uh, at the time. Uh, and interestingly enough, that probably was at least part of the story. But the better part of the story was uh, the president was beginning to line up the uh, forces for ultimate entry into World War I. Uh, and as war with Germany became more and more imminent, it became more and more necessary. And at, this is the point when William Jennings Bryan uh, withdrew himself uh, from Wilson's cabinet, uh, saying that your actions will lead us into war with Germany, uh, at which time the president made that very interesting quote, which has been said again later in different situations. Uh, but I don't think it's anything that strays very far from the absolute quote, and that was, we will never be at war with Germany. Uh, prophetic. <laughs> uh, so this is, a, this is a part of the troops being sent off. And the, the photographer, just a, a private photographer, a guy with a camera, took a lot of pictures at the time. Here they are 
marching down O Street to be boarded on the train to head off. And of course, war started with Germany August the 4th of 1914. And at that point in time, uh, we find that 25% of the students in the United States studied the German language in high school. Um, there, within Nebraska, there were actually 40 German-speaking newspapers published, several of them uh, in the city of Lincoln at a point in which Lincoln was uh, one of the very largest uh, newspaper posting places in the United States, in other words, putting into the mail. Uh, one, one figure I saw said that they were number one, but I don't think that's probably accurate, it was, but they were certainly one of the top. Uh, April 6, 1917, uh, the United States actually entered the war, uh, and at that point in time, interesting things were going on in Nebraska. For example, we had a town in Nebraska called Berlin, Nebraska, and they changed the name of Berlin, Nebraska, to Oto, Nebraska. And only after they changed it did they realize uh, that Berlin, Nebraska was not named for Berlin, Germany. It was named for a farmer whose last name happened to be Berlin. But it was probably enough that they would have changed the name even so. Um, also, we have Germantown, Nebraska, where Ted Kuzer lives. Uh, got its name changed. Uh, the German National Bank changed its name. People were becoming very conscious of anything German. And uh, yesterday, one of our employees told me that that was the first time they had seen French fries and sauerkraut with their name changed to something else, uh, so that we didn't have to say French fries either, and nor German. Sauerkraut took on a new name as well, Freedom Kraut and freedom fries. That's the first time it appeared. We remember not so very long we, we, we got mad uh, and changed french fries uh, to temporarily at least in the cafeterias in Washington DC to freedom fries. So it was not a new idea. Uh, the University of Nebraska extended graduation privileges to any student who enlisted as long as he had good grades he would, he would be allowed to graduate without even finishing his exams. Uh, the Lincoln Star editorialized at that time that some of the faculty was so saturated with Bolshevism and ultra-socialism to be ineffective, and they called for a lot of resignation. Sixteen professors and instructors uh, were the subject of hearings, and three professors were actually asked to resign, uh, probably not with a great deal of reason in some cases. Uh, in June of 1918, we had, let's see, we're getting a little bit behind, this uh, signboard appeared down on the area next to the old city hall at 10th and O Streets. Uh, and of course the war effort had all sorts of signs around and uh, uh, later on uh, we saw signs like this pop up all over the United States in the 60s and 70s when we were trying to conserve energy. Try very hard not to hit the right, wrong button here. Uh, one of the things that happened in June of 1918 was 900 men arrived at the University of Nebraska Ag Campus where barracks had been built, uh, where they were going, going to be trained as mechanical engineers. Uh, some of them were quartered in these barracks, which I've never quite been able to figure out exactly where on the campus they were located, but they were on the East Campus someplace. Uh, many of them were also quartered in the then just being completed Social Sciences Building, uh, which we now call the... the uh, building. Well, it's directly across the street from the Temple Building, and now I think it is, uh, well, it was business administration, but I don't what have they changed it to now? Um, at any rate, the building is still there, and they were quartered in that building. They used the Temple Building uh, for a cafeteria, um, and then later on, of course, the Temple Building will figure into Channel 12's uh, origins as well, and uh, Teachers College and so forth. Uh, Chancellor Avery, at that time, stepped aside, joined the Army and became a major in the Chemical Corps, uh, for which he sometimes did not receive glowing after the war uh, reviews because he was working on things like poison gases and so forth, so pluses and minuses always. Uh, ultimately in the war, 52,526 Nebraskans served. Uh, 1,700 died in combat, 90 of which were from Lancaster County. But the war did end, and here we see troops returning uh, and marching down. And I guess here's one place we could see uh, some, some buildings that are just now have hoarding up around them uh, being torn down. We're looking what today would be from the parking garage or the old Baker Hardware. We're looking towards the southeast, and we can see 
uh, buildings which are being now torn down for the two hotels which will take their place. Nothing probably else in that picture stands out other than we can see the old county courthouse over in the corner. Enter the Smiths, but not right away. <laughs> uh, in 1890, a man by the name of Ode Rector, O-D-E, a, a name I've never really come in contact with before or since, moved to this building, which was called the Alexander Building, which is on the southeast corner of 12th and O Streets. Uh, at that time, one of the people who had an office in this building was a man up on one of the upper floors by the name of Frank Woods. He had his auctioneer office up there. Um, primarily at that time he was dealing in auctioneering, he was dealing in livestock, and just beginning to deal in real estate, and of course ultimately will become the Woods Brothers. Uh, in 1917, uh, the building was leased uh, by McGee's Clothing Company. Uh, we did touch on this a little bit in a program or two before, and for some reason or other, the slide came up again, a different slide and a different story, so I may be repeating a little bit of it. Ellery Davis was then hired uh, by Mr. McGee to design a five-story building to set on that tract. Uh, March 1 of 1918, the Alexander Building was raised. March 1, it was raised. March 13th, O. N. McGee passed away, which may be part of the reason why the five-story building, which was designed by Ellery Davis, was never built. Uh, instead, a three-story building was built in its place, which we recognize still standing there with the terracotta. Nice work around it. Um, Nellie McGee, O. N. McGee's wife, uh, they had come from Valparaiso, and she took over as president of the corporation. 1964, uh, Nellie died, turned the business over primarily to Robert and Sons. Uh, by that time, the Gateway store was just opening about the time she died. Then in 1968, they opened a store at Omaha Crossroads and later stores in Aurora and Sterling, Colorado. That building, of course, is still there, and a penthouse was built up on the top. Uh, and I'm not sure, did Craig live up there for a while, or is it just you, you Clay, lived up there for a while? Uh, and uh, it's still there and, and, and used for various and sundry uh, meetings and so forth, but the only way you can see it is to get on a building a little bit taller and look down on it. Now we are looking at the Rudge and Gunzel Company, which moves all over in the city of Lincoln. It starts in Lincoln in 1885 when Jeremiah Morris and C.H. Rudge came to the city of Lincoln from Youngstown, Ohio, they opened a store called Rudge and Morris in 1886 at 130 South 11th Street, which would put them on the um, east side of what's now the Golds uh, block or the Golds building. Mr. Morris, within a few months, however, returned to Ohio for unknown reasons. And in 1889, they will open two stores side by side. They took two businesses and opened at 1118 and 1124 N Street, which would put that in the parking garage on the north side, uh, the center block. Uh, at that time, they expanded their business from dry goods to also furniture and hardware. In fact, one of the two sort of mirror image buildings uh, became the hardware store. And it was at that time that Carl Gunzel uh, joined the firm. Then in 1892, it was reincorporated as Rudge and Gunzel. Two or three of us in here are old enough to remember the name Rudge and Gunzel, even if we don't remember the uh, building itself. Uh, they're going to move again. Um, in 1903, uh, they will take over this building on the southwest corner of 11th and 0. Again, this is the corner of Golds, uh, looking towards the southwest. Uh, then in 1918, let's see, let's, we got a little bit out of sequence here. This is the dual stores, which were on N Street. And again, some of you will remember these stores uh, on the north side of N facing towards the south. Then they will begin uh, in 1918 to build a new multi-story 25,000 square foot uh, department store. Um, and we can see it going up in this picture. This is one of those where I could bore you for a long time because I've got like eight or ten pictures showing how the building is uh, ultimately completed. Uh, also in 1918, Stanley and Ernest Gunzel's sons joined the firm. Then in, it opens and in 1929, 
uh, an interior view. In 1929, it was purchased by Allied Stores, uh, which was a chain of stores, still called uh, Rudge and Gunzel's at that point in time. Um, then it became the Mercantile Investment Company, and in fact, during World War II, the USO moved into that building on at least the ground level, possibly the lower level as well. Then in 1941, uh, and I got this from uh, Bob Gunzel, who was my law teacher at the University of Nebraska, uh, and later this was refuted by an article in Nebraska History Quarterly. However, I heard it from Bob Gunzel, and that's who I'm reporting it from, uh, who told me that the store was closed in 1941 by Allied stores in order to avoid paying the excise profit tax, which was to help the United States during time of World War II. Uh, so it's both, it's, it's a negative comment on Allied, but it's nothing to do with Rudge and Gunzel, but Bob Gunzel told me that, and a, as I said, a subsequent article in the Nebraska Catch Quarterly says that's not true. Uh, but you can take your choice. Uh, at any rate, 1947, the building uh, was leased and became Sears and Roebuck downtown, which is how you probably remember it, and this picture I put in for Matt. You know why, because you can see that uh, lamp there very clearly, and I presume that's the one you were looking at. And that's the reason I couldn't find it when you asked me for the picture. It was a slide, uh, not easily, easily found. So Sears took over in 1947, then later National Bank of Commerce will move into that building temporarily while their new building is built at 13th and O Streets. Uh, and that's when the escalators get turned around and moved, which seemed like a tremendous expense at the time to me for no good reason. Then it became the atrium, uh, which it still is today, downtown Lincoln Shopping Center, right? Uh, not so much. I'm not sure what you could buy in the atrium anymore. Uh, but of course, at one time, the Skywalk was uh, connected through the atrium. Uh, and it, we looked at one point to, to have a store in there. And at the time we looked, I think there was a window of maybe 18 months or two years where the highest traffic, foot traffic in downtown Lincoln was recorded in the atrium. And it looked like a really good spot to have a retail store, but somehow or another, I didn't, st I didn't move immediately. Which, like not buying a Nehru jacket immediately, was probably a pretty good thing as it turned out, because uh, retail business up there never did really work out very well. Salt Creek has been a constant flooding problem even uh, well before the city of Lincoln or Lancaster existed. In fact, we have reports of the uh, Salt Creek flooding in 1861, which would have been even pre the city of Lancaster. Uh, so it was obviously been flooding forever before that. If you stop and think about it, it's a low-lying area, uh, draining quite a bit of land. So as you know, far back as we could record it, there have been floods in there. 1864 in July uh, is when John Gregory, who was the postmaster in uh, Lincoln, but actually John Gregory's post office, which was called Gregory's Basin, uh, that was the name of the post office, which would become Lincoln. But he called it Gregory's Basin, and his post office facility was probably located on West Charleston Street, where later we will see Dr. White's veterinary clinic. In fact, Dr. White, who had quite an expansive layout out there, he had barns for horses, and uh, his chicken coop was probably the base of it was probably the post office that John Gregory had established as Gregory's Basin in 1864. And he called it Gregory's Basin because he wanted his name to always be permanently associated with this area. Didn't work, uh, not, not very well anyway. Uh, but at any rate, in 1864, we know that Salt Creek flooded because John Gregory, as postmaster, was sent to the city of uh, Beatrice to re return all of the court and county records from the old Clay County north half to Lancaster County. Now, Clay County at that time was a square county located midway between the north stack, north and south stack of Lancaster Clay Gage. Uh, and because John Cadman who lived in the north half of then Clay County, wanted to represent in the new state legislature a larger community, he oversaw the dissolving of Old Clay County with the north half attached to Lancaster, the south half attached to Gage County, 
giving us instead of three squares, two rectangles as we see today, and also doing in the odds of Claytonia becoming the county seat of Clay County. Uh, Claytonia is still there, but it never did, never did happen. Uh, kind of an interesting town to visit. At any rate, he sent to have the north half of the county records returned to Lancaster County, and in Salt Creek, the wagon coming back overturned, and all of the evidence of the north half of Clay County was lost in the floodwaters. So maybe if you look downstream a little bit, maybe if we could put in the right kind of screening at Teresa Street, maybe we could find some of those, but I think it's long, long gone. Um, we're now coming into the time when Lincoln is going to be better recorded, and with statehood, we're going to have a newspaper here. Uh, and in 1873, uh, the newspaper recorded that the bottoms west of Lincoln flooded. Um, this would kind of take in most of the uh, what we call the arena area today, which is still in a floodplain, but not like it was then, because we've built up, I think, uh, Bill Obosensky, we discovered that there are certain places where there's 17 feet of fill down in there, or between 7 and 17 feet. And we have some line drawings which show, for example, a storm sewer-like thing coming out of N Street and emptying down into the uh, yards of the Burlington. And it looks to be taller than I am, but it's a line drawing, so you can't prove it. Uh, also in 1874, we begin to have German immigrants, or Germans from Russia, beginning to purchase land in what we call the South Bottom area today. Uh, a derogatory sort of name, it was more descriptive of the area because we divided it into the North Bottoms and the South Bottoms. Um, the reason that the South Bottoms became attractive from Germ to Germans from Russia was primarily almost all of the land down there belonged to the Burlington and Missouri River Railroad and they wanted to get rid of it and they were selling it cheap. So that's what happened there. Uh, June 13th of 1874, another flood occurred. Two people died, uh, and this, these people may be the first fatalities we see recorded in a uh, flood of Salt Creek. I'm not sure. Uh, 1889, the South Bottoms took on three foot of water. Park School was used as a shelter at that point in time. The railroads were closed. And again, we have lots of pictures uh, taken from the viaduct in both areas of trains and everything underwater. At that point in time, the water reached 7th and 0. By 1902, this picture is a little bit late, uh, but 1902 they said the flooding of Salt Creek hit its highest point. Uh, by 1905, we had a flood along in there where nine people died. We think this picture is probably taken in that 1905 flooding. Uh, and that flood was an interesting one in that the flood waters from Salt Creek, uh, it appears that it got up to 12th and 0, but it's a little bit, it's a stretch. But it also, Antelope Creek flooded, and the water sort of left an island uh, running through Lincoln, including Mount Emerald District was at a high point, for example. But in fact, although Antelope Creek flooded, and we have some great pictures of it coming up and being over the street where the Rock Island Railroad is, this is, this is, this is kind of a, it's not a fake picture, it's definitely a good picture. Uh, these two guys riding by on their motorcycle at 12th and O, we're looking and we can see on the left-hand side, Security Mutual building over the Burr Block. Um, I don't know whether the motorcycle was actually running in this picture. But the flood water was not this deep at 12th and 0. Now that sounds like a contradiction in terms, but what was happening was the storm sewers couldn't handle the outflow fast enough. So in fact, uh, the storm sewers blocking up caused the water to rise this high. It wasn't technically Salt Creek coming up this high. But of course, as we build more and more rooftops, more and more streets, uh, and nothing to absorb water, it becomes worse and worse. And the thing that I find interesting about this picture is almost all of the buildings, any consequence along O Street at least, had areaways, not just in the basement, but underneath the sidewalks, in some places up to and even perhaps encroaching underneath O Street. So those would have literally been full of water. Uh, the two where it's easy to get to and look at uh, are uh, Steve Glenn's uh, travel agency, which is at about 12.27 Oast, something like that. Uh, the basements of those buildings you can see very clearly, and because they have not 
changed them much unless he has done it recently. When Boomers was in there, uh, I went in the basement, and there's still buildings that are built with rubble wall foundations with no cement between them, dirt. Uh, and in fact, when Boomers was there, they had, to, they had to constantly keep cleaning underneath there because you can look and see this rubble wall foundation and the dirt just kept, the stone, of course, was coming off too. It's very friable. Uh, and sloughing off sand and dirt coming out of the walls. So most of them were gunited over, but you can still see clearly in there where this was actually underwater. Uh, boomers went under the sidewalk with a coal bin clear out, and it appears to maybe have been a little bit under O Street, I'm not sure. And most of those areaways, I'm looking at Bob to see if you'll nod yes or no. Uh, most of those areaways, I take it like under Miller and Payne's, where one of their cafeterias was under 13th Street, they're still there. Uh, and what is my understanding is that they pay a lease payment to the city uh, on those areaways or vaultways that are under, under the sidewalks. But if you're underneath uh, in the old gold sub base or the basement cafeteria, you didn't know you were under the street or the sidewalk. Uh, so this, I don't know, I've drifted way away from the topic here, haven't I? Okay, uh, so the storm sewers did this. Uh, another flood in 1908. Then in 1911, Antelope Creek was straightened out, uh, which uh, did away with most of the flooding on Antelope Creek, and a tube was built which dropped underground and went from N Street, about where the old swimming pool was, and later the Kulkin Pool, which is also now gone, uh, ran underground over to Vine Street, about where Cushman Motors was. Uh, and in fact, not so very long, we still took tours of people down there and walked through that tube. It's a very big tube, and of course it pops up uh, along the way once in a while with manhole covers. 1913, the bottoms again flooded. They're going to just keep flooding, even though uh, Antelope Creek has been straightened. Uh, 1950 was the time I remember, because when I was a kid, uh, we got driven down there by my father to see the people going around all of the South Bottoms in rowboats. All, it was all underwater. Uh, 6.75 inches of rain fell overnight, and that's what did that one. Uh, 500 homes were either destroyed or heavily damaged. Nine people were killed. This is maybe the last time we see actual fatalities of a flood. Then the Salt uh, Wahoo Watershed was created and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, at that point in time started building 12 dams. Uh, by 1960 they had completed 17 dams and with the completion of those dams, we pretty much have done away with flooding in the downtown Lincoln area, particularly what we think of the arena area. Uh, Holmes Lake being the one that we think of the dam, which did probably the most protection. Uh, it's also about in this time, in the late 50s, 1960s, that Joe Seacrest uh, came up with the idea of making what now we call the Antelope Park Creek Parkway or something like that into a street which would close in times of a rainstorm and become a creek which would carry water off. Now that's not exactly what happened, but we have, the, uh, we have that stream built in there which connects Antelope Creek, again, uh, with Salt Creek. Uh, by 1963, we never had another over six inch flood uh, or a rainstorm, but no flooding occurred. So I think we pretty much got it done today. However, I don't think you'll find any buildings down in the arena area that have foundations. I'm not sure of that, but I don't think any of them are built. This, this is a late picture. This is probably <coughs> less than five years ago. Did you hear that less than five years ago, Lita? Okay, everything is less than five years ago, or maybe just more than five years ago. And anyway, in that time, this is again right at 12th and O Streets, uh, a picture from the Journal Star Files with kids uh, stalled their car right there. That 1908 flood was a pretty good size one. This is taken from the viaduct, and we're looking here towards the north over the Burlington Railroad yards, and you can pick out things, but the buildings you can obviously see, we're talking about three, four, five feet of water in most areas under there. An interesting picture also taken during that flood was of O.J. Shaw's filling station on O Street. Uh, at this point in time, uh, it was still not only legal to have gasoline and oil tanks above ground, but in some cases it was required. Uh, and a lady that worked in O.J. Shaw's office told me that she, their office I think was in the Sharp Building at that time, they got a call from the University of Nebraska that said one of your oil tanks is floating over here by the stadium. Uh, could you come get it? Uh, so they would, they would just simply float away, uh, being easily, easily buoyant. 
1923, we talked last time, uh, and we, we took this through the uh, implosion of the Cornhusker Hotel. But to recap, because there are some new pictures here I wanted you to see, in 1923, the Lancaster Hotel Corporation was formed. They then bought the east half of Block 89 uh, on 13th Street between L and M. They purchased the First Presbyterian Church and the First Congregational Church. Then in 1926, the new Cornhusker Hotel was completed primarily by the Abel Construction Company. Ten stories, 300 rooms, brick and stone, and it was leased to a man by the name of Harry Weaver. Then in 1930, it was purchased uh, by Charles Schimmel, who also at that time owned the Blackstone Hotel in Omaha, uh, the Lassen Hotel in Wichita, and ultimately they'll have a couple of others here and there. Uh, they put one brother, A.Q. Schimmel, in Lincoln to be the manager of this hotel, manager director. Uh, this is the basement area where uh, the barber shop was, and another picture of the barber shop. They will add on to that hotel, um, 1970 period, which will be the ballroom, which is directly to the west of the hotel. Then in 1982, they will implode it, and we talked about that in our last meeting. Uh, and Matt is going to tell me how many Indian uh, and wheat maiden figures appear in the new building that were salvaged. Do we know how many there was? Is it, there, does? there were 28 on the old building, and there's 20. Okay, 28 from the old building, and they salvaged some of them, and 20 made their way to the new Cornhusker Hotel, primarily or all in that atrium area. Are any of them in the atrium area terracotta replacements? or? Okay, okay. I think they did make some terracotta ones, didn't they? But I don't know. Other than the one you have, I don't know where they ended up. Okay. In 1905, uh, the city of Lincoln had a high school which is located today where Pershing Municipal Auditorium sits. Um, but by 1905, in the high school, on that site, there were 1,200 students in a building which was designed to handle no more than 850, which schools that tends to happen to. Um, 1907, a new law came about, a state law, which uh, said that children had to stay in school until the age of 16, which put a further crimp in it because up until that time, many students would not stay in school until 16. Anyway, so we're overcrowded, and suddenly it will be exacerbated by keeping everyone in school until the age of 16. So now we're going to have to consider where we're going to build a new high school. Uh, one of the sites considered was quite naturally the block where the old school sat, the Pershing Municipal Auditorium site. Um, then they considered, should they build two high schools? Or should they use the money to build two high schools and an elementary school or two? A great deal of discussion, particularly within the community. Uh, the Lincoln High School students started a campaign against having two high schools. Uh, and they, they, they entitled it, Which School Gets the Piano? Uh, because apparently the students had gotten together and bought a piano for the high school, and they didn't want some other school to end up with their piano. And, you know, it got a great deal of attention. Ultimately, four different tracts of land will be considered for the new high school. 22nd and J. Some of these you can kind of imagine in your head. 14th and Vine. Uh, 14th and A. And the old site uh, on, the, on the auditorium site. Uh, in the meantime, then, what had been at 14th and Vine, or 14th and V, actually, at that point in time, Vine Street originally didn't start until about 17th or 8th Street. It was V Street until I got up that far. At least at that one point, we'll make all of V Street will become Vine Street as well. I have a lot of peculiar things happening with the streets. They're trying to bring all the names together so that the street named University Place will be renamed U Street. I mean, it all makes sense, uh, but that was a good idea. So we'll, say, we'll call it 14th and Vine. That's where the old uh, dormitory building, which had been built by private funds, we talked about that 15, 16 talks ago. Uh, they're going to tear it down and salvage the lumber so that that site will become available. This would be directly across the street from Moral Hall to the east, which up until a couple years ago, uh, had been a grassy area. Um, but the question became then, if they did use the site where the old school had been located, 
they would have a problem as to where to put the students while they were building a new building on that block. Plus somebody also pointed out that they did build a new building on the block where the auditorium sits. There would be no room for any playing fields or anything uh, adjacent to, uh, to the other building. Uh, the Davenport track, the 26th and J, slowly were winnowing the others off. It had a couple of very good points uh, in, its, in its favor. One was that the city was growing very rapidly towards the east, uh, and also that it was very near Antelope Park. What, why that was a good idea, I don't know, but those were the two plus points. Uh, the negatives far outweighed the pluses, however. The Davenport track, as it was called, was where if a circus came to town, or any sort of traveling show, some of which were rather unsavory, they would locate there. So it had a negative uh, sort of an image about it. It was also directly in the floodplain of Antelope Creek, which would be a, a tremendous negative. It was right next to the railroad track. And at that time, there was no bridge on J Street, so there really was no way to connect with uh, the city to the east where it was growing. So lots of negatives, and one strong and one rather tepid positive. Uh, in the meantime, they're looking back. 17th Street was becoming noisy downtown overcrowded, uh, and any extra land that they needed would become expensive. So they're thinking not to do that. They still haven't made up their mind, so um, they did what Northeast High School would do, uh, is make a mistake. They asked the parents to vote on where to put the school. Now the school board had a very clear opinion, uh, but nonetheless the parents chose 26th and J Street. Um, Despite the, the school board's strong objections, they didn't want it there at all. Uh, they ultimately will buy the Davenport tract, which originally consisted of 15 acres of land for which they paid $18,171, so a, a smidge over $1,000 an acre. School bonds were approached in 1909, but they failed. They tried again in 1910, and they failed. They tried again in 1911, and this time they passed very easily because the school bond issues tied some other things together. They provided for the construction of Whittier School, Bancroft School, which sits almost where at 14th and V Vine, where the old uh, dormitory convent building had been torn down. Uh, so it passed easily, and we're going to get three schools, uh, two of which still stand. Bancroft has now been uh, long since abandoned as a grade school, taken over by the university, and it's been torn down now for that new sort of combination uh, computer uh, dormitory and classrooms and so forth. Really quite a spectacular place. The new building, uh, 22 and J, the cornerstone will be laid June the 20th of 1913, and the cornerstone will be a gift from uh, the 1909 and 1911 classes. And at that time, they will also lay a trolley car track down J Street. Got lights, lots of great pictures of that as well. Um, this is the auditorium the night of the dedication. Uh, dedicated September the 14th of 1915. Uh, it would have been dedicated sometime before that, but they had to put off the dedication because of a smallpox epidemic. Uh, 20, 1927, they made the first major addition to the school, an 18-room addition, and ultimately they will take over uh, what was called the Bonacum Institute, uh, which had become by that time the PSAB, the Public Schools Administration Building, which was to be a high school uh, owned by uh, the Roman Catholic Church, directly to the, and almost connected to Lincoln High School, to the southwest. Uh, Public Schools Administration takes that over. Ultimately, that will become um, the science wing. I don't know whether it's still the science wing uh, of Lincoln High School, but it's still there, certainly. Uh, then uh, they built a gymnasium, and at that time they got a new swimming pool and turned the old swimming pool into a library. Um, but the north elevation of the building, if you look at it, uh, is virtually unchanged. You can see it just about as it existed originally. Back downtown Lincoln. Uh, in 1878, a sanitarium uh, was being built uh, near 9th and P Streets, taking advantage of the mineral waters which they were uh, pumping or getting from an artesian well, which was in the middle of the block 9th, 10th OP, where the old city hall, uh, old post office buildings are located. And that well we talked about too a long time ago, probably still there. Uh, that well uh, furnished 
sulfur uh, and saline and mineral baths to hotels in the area, quite a few of whom had uh, advertised cure, curing baths, mineral baths, Russian baths, sulfo saline bath, and my favorite, the electric bath, uh, which, you know, if you weren't very careful, it just simply zinc plated you, uh, which might be good at any rate. Uh, at any rate, in 1892, two doctors, brothers, M.H. and J.O. Everett, uh, set upon building another uh, major uh, sanitarium, sanatorium, hospital, depending on how you want to define it, uh, at 14th and M Streets. <laughs> this would be where the current SOB sits, state office building. You know what I mean. Right? Um, the Lincoln Sanitarium, as we see completed here, um, in the late 1890s, it was a 110-bed hospital uh, and also had attached to it a natatorium, which was an indoor swimming pool for all intents and purposes. They advertised at that time that over 800 visitors a day were coming to the hospital. How many of them were going to just swim at the natatorium? I don't know, but that's an advertisement, so I have an I no idea what the numbers meant. But within that time period, now we're going to come up with Capitol Beach. And with Capitol Beach, we have salt water, outdoor bathing, which is really taking over, and they will close the natatorium. And in fact, finally in 1928, uh, they will tear down the building. Here it is coming down. Uh, and at that point in time, they'll put a small building on the property, maybe the size of this auditorium, one story tall, which was a used car lots office with glass, and a very nondescript building owned by O'Shea Rogers, whose building was directly across the street at that time. Uh, one the primary building would have been to the west as an adjunct to the now parking garage. Um, O'Shea Rogers sold used cars in the lot that was there. Uh, then, ultimately, they will tear down that entire uh, block again, clean it off. And when they did that, I was out of town, but someone should have stepped in because they noticed as they dug out the basement to clean out for making the basement for the state office building, that on the west side of the basement, below grade, was a huge stone arch, which they described in the paper as being eight or ten feet tall uh, and like five or six feet wide. Huge stone arch. And nobody could tell them what that was. It's very simple. That was where the steam pipes came from uh, the old steam plant that the city had done on K Street, uh, the building of which is still there. I'm about to revert to the city, I think. Um, and also mineral water was brought in from that, as opposed, or in addition to three wells which they sunk on that property, which they found were still there, 220, 400, and 900 feet deep, bringing up different types of mineral water, which again, would not only give you a saline swimming pool, but also something curative. In fact, the curative waters coming from the uh, 9th, 10th OP artesian well, it would cure anything, anything. And if you read it, uh, every, the only thing I didn't see in there was falling arches. It, it cured everything else. Uh, amazing. Why didn't we keep that? Uh, that, now we have the state office building. Is your office in there? Okay. Stewart Theater. And we either lost a slide or it'll come up later. Um, the Stewart building, of course. This is a picture of the exterior of the building under construction. It was commissioned in 1927 by Charles Stewart, the architect again, Ellery Davis. Uh, Ellery Davis Sr. The contractor was the Olson Construction Company uh, and the contract between Stewart and Olson uh, is a framed document which was on Jim Stewart Sr.'s office wall, probably ended up on Jimbo's wall and I'm sure somebody still got it tacked up someplace. It is less than one page, double spaced, eight and a half by eleven and basically what it says is you build it, I will pay you. That's practically all it says. Uh, a, sort of a cost plus building. So this is the kind of contract we're issuing in 1927. Uh, when we became the first lease signed in East Park Plaza uh, in 1978-79, 
There were three attorneys involved in building that building, and we signed a 37-page single-spaced document, eight and a half by 14 inches, with another 12 pages of addendum, which basically, you know, we had to give up everything. In fact, Laura doesn't know it now, but you know, first child was included in there, I think, too. So the difference between a contract in 1927 when you knew the people you were dealing with and, and completely different. 13 story, $1.25 million to build. It took one year, literally, to build the building. Amazing. Uh, primarily Bedford and Indiana limestone, bronze, marble, wrought iron, just a really beautiful building which opened uh, June 10, 1929. I like this picture because if you look over in the background right there, you can see the Capitol building is still an uncompleted dome, and you can also see uh, another office building over there. Um, and it's going to, that's, I think, I can't tell by looking here, so I will apologize. I'm going to look at the wall, John. Yeah, that is the Sharp building, not the Federal Securities building. I can't tell by looking here. I've been told not to look at the screen, but uh, I just had to do it. So. July 10, 1929, this is an interior view. When the building was completed, it was considered to be the second best building in the state of Nebraska. Now, whether we're including the Capitol building at that time, I don't know. Who knows? When you say something like that, you can never really know. Uh, this is one of the two orchestras that they had in the building. Uh, this was the stage band. Uh, this, this picture has a friend of mine in it. Uh, in fact, three friends of mine, Lowell Boomer is in there, uh, and Emmanuel Wishnow uh, was the concertmaster, and the third person's name has now flown out of my brain, uh, can't remember it. Okay, the first night the theater opened, uh, the ticket was purchased by a man by the name of Eli Shire, who was a clothing merchant in the city of Lincoln. He paid one dollar for that ticket. And he paid an extra 40 cents. Everybody else, the uh, ticket price was 60 cents, which was inflated anyway. Uh, but ticket number one was stamped on a sheet of solid gold, according to the press release. Uh, and they said it had cost them $500 to produce that ticket. They then gave that ticket to the State Historical Society who promptly has lost all track of it. <laughs> uh, if it ever happened, if it ever happened at all, they don't have any record of it. Uh, they did have the largest theater orchestra west of Chicago. Uh, the primary orchestra had 25 pieces. Uh, the first movie was called The Rainbow Man, which was 100% talking and singing, according to it. In the basement were dressing rooms for 80 people. Uh, the building also, or the theater itself, won the Westinghouse Award for Acoustics when it was completed. Exterior of the building, uh, the area behind the theater portion, which would be to the right in this picture. Um, what else can we tell you about it? Um, there were six chandeliers in the main auditorium. Two of them weighed two and a half tons each. And each one of the larger chandeliers required 450 light bulbs. How does that compare to the chandelier in the middle of the rotunda? A few more. A few more? Okay. Lots of light bulbs. <laughs> uh, it seated 1,856 people. And we're looking here from the upper balcony down towards the stage. Also uh, on the stage was the largest applique embroidered velvet theater curtain in the world. Does somebody I know own a piece of that, or am I making this up too? Or do you think you might, I mean? Some of it ended up in David City, I think, on the Opera House there. Some of it may be in somebody's attic in Lincoln, or not. I, I won't mention any names. Uh, and we can also see in this picture one of the things which we kind of forget about, and that is that there was an organ which came up uh, from the ground, as did the organ at the Lincoln Theater. 1949, the theater was sold, of course, uh, to Jim Stewart, Charles Stewart, so Jim, not a great sale. This is uh, looking from the stage up towards the loge and the two balconies above it. 
Uh, here we can see the stage and we can see, I think those are probably the two large chandeliers. I'm not positive. Uh, and one of the side walls. Then in 1972, while the Orpheum Theater in Omaha was being redone at a cost of $2 million, we were in the business of tearing out uh, the theater, lowering the, uh, not the true ceiling, we're going to lower a false ceiling, pull the chandeliers up, and seal off the balconies. Part of that goes to the fact that they can rent movies based on the number of seats. So they actually had to remove the seats from the loge and the upper about two balconies uh, to, to prove to the people that they weren't going to have more seats than that. Uh, Lots of ownership changes. In 1985, the Lincoln Foundation comes in. 1985-86, uh, Larry Price will change it, to, for the most part, to condominiums. Uh, 2002, the Rococo Theater will open. Uh, and that will be a great expense to bring back a great deal of the grandeur, not quite what it was originally, but uh, a great deal of the grandeur will be brought back by the Dieters. And it's there today as a great venue uh, we're now down to a couple minutes, so I'll see if we've engendered any questions at this point. Was there much damage done to the theater when they... Well, one of the things, let's see, was that, was it Bob? It was Bob Hanna? Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, Bob Hanna, uh, the question was what damage was done to the theater. Uh, and at that time, Bob Hanna was an architect. I think he still had an office maybe in the building, but with, people were being edged out. Um, and he sort of chained himself to the building because one of the things they were doing was they were taking a jackhammer to all of those side balconies, which you can see one in there. They just jackhammered them off, turned them to dust, and took them down. Uh, of course, they saved the chandeliers by pulling them up. Uh, they covered over the orchestra pit, took out the organ, and they also dropped a wall in on the back of the stage so we can have movies, but the back wall then opened into what became what we used to call Babby Mobies. Because if you look at the sign on the alley, which should say Barrymore's, the lettering is not too clear. It looks like Babby Mobies. Uh, and it became that uh, bar restaurant. So the, the theater itself, the auditorium, was greatly changed. As far as I know, the 80 dressing rooms may still be there. They were there last I knew. And one of the most interesting things in the building is the second movie theater, which is in there that nobody knows about. But if you step away from the building and look at the 13th Street facade, you will see an Oriel window up two or three stories uh, with stained glass in it. That is a little stairway which leads from the back of probably the second balcony into a screening theater. Uh, which the screen faced, as my recollection at that time, it either faced towards the north or towards the east. I can't remember. It seated probably 25 or 35 people, and the newspaper and other people would screen new movies before they were shown at any theater in Lincoln. That's the screening theater. Uh, and it used the same projection booth as the uh, shine down on the regular screen. So you can kind of get an idea if you can remember where all those features were in the old building. That's kind of the thing that left, was left afterwards. And as far as I know, that screening room is still there. Somebody's going to have to go in there and tell me, but I think it is still there. Another question? Okay, I thank you very much. I think we'll be back again uh, a month from today. Yep, okay, thank you.